Hey, welcome everybody, it's good to see you. Welcome to Sunday. If you're like me, you have to look at your phone to even figure out what day it is, but it's Sunday, May 3rd, and I'm glad you're taking time out of your schedule to be with us. It's always good to see you guys. Um, wanna, before we jump into our time together, talk a little bit about what I know is on a lot of people's minds. Um, here in our state, we have begun the process of reopening. Um, we did that starting on Friday and the safer at home rule has not been renewed. And so people are starting to kind of get out and, and nose around in the community a little bit. Um, for those of you that are a regular part of our church, you've heard me say that I'm a part of a, an accountability group. It's a group of five pastors from all over the country and we meet a couple of times a year and um, just kind of grow together. And one of those uh, group members lives in Texas and they're a little bit ahead of Tennessee and he sent out some advice that I've really taken to heart that I wanna share with you guys because Texas is a little bit ahead of, of our state. And what he said to us was, um, don't ever forget that it has taken decades for you to earn the trust of your community. And you can ruin that trust in one bad decision. And I thought about that for a couple of weeks since he sent that. And, and I know that um, things are beginning to be a little bit different around our city and around our state. One thing I know for sure is our economy has got to open. And we have a lot of you guys that are small business owners and you depend on that stream of income to keep your family alive and fed. And our economy has got to open. People have got to go back to work. But what we don't have to do is rush back to church because our church has never closed. Um, literally in the flick of a switch, we were able to go to an online format. In fact, I would argue that right now you have more access to content to help grow your soul than you did before the pandemic hit. And so I want Cokesbury Church to be very thoughtful and very mindful as we begin this process of thinking about what does church look like when we're back physically together. And I'll be honest with you guys. Um, earlier this week, we got um, a set of guidelines from the Knox County uh, Health Department that laid out some strategy for how you do that. And then on Friday, uh, the governor superseded that, and so we've got a brand new list of things that we have to consider, and I just don't feel any urgency for us to get back together physically because I want us to be a good community partner. Uh, we have such a diverse group of people who call Cokesbury Church home, not just a diversity in age, but we have folks who are battling a whole variety of different health experiences, and I don't want to make anyone feel guilty that they've got to rush back into church because there's just so many options for us to grow. And so what I want us to do is to give our staff time, give our lay leadership time to kind of think this through, um, to make the right decisions so that when that moment does come and we feel like we can invite folks to physically be here, that we've done the very best that we could possibly do. So if your friends are asking you, hey, when is your church gonna reopen? You've got full permission to tell them we never actually closed because that is the truth. We're just existing right now as a church that has completely left the building. And so I hope that that helps you guys. Uh, we'll be over communicating with you over the next few weeks as we start to figure out how we're gonna do this. And so today though, I wanna deal with what I think is kind of the underlying theme to this whole experience that you and I have been going through over the past six or seven weeks is this idea of fear. And can we just be honest for a second? Like the fear is real, right? Like so much is going on so quickly. You and I are part of one of the rare generations to experience exponential change in an incredibly short amount of time. And then mid-March happened. You almost can't help but be fearful. I think about all that's happened with this coronavirus. It's evolved so quickly in all of our experiences. About six weeks ago as a church, we were planning on hosting our regular schedule of services that week. A lot of you guys were making plans to go out on spring break. It's been a really rainy uh, fall and winter here in East Tennessee. And so a lot of us were thinking about, hey, let's get down south and go to the beach. But then that Thursday happened. Remember that Thursday? We got notice that we were going to have an extended school closures. There were disaster declarations. Suddenly businesses had about 24 hours to shut down. We got a safer at home order. 
And then we were told that there were no gatherings, over 10 people. And with all that's happened, with all of the news and with all of the lost jobs and with all of the restrictive movements, and now we've got this slow reopening that's going on and that brings with it a whole new level of anxiety, right? <laughs> like, is it time? What can I do? What can I do? Is it actually safe? Who's got the virus and who doesn't? And the end result is fear happens. And that fear that we all experience on some level, I think in a lot of ways, it's actually worse than the virus itself. And the reason fear happens, of course, is because you and I are human. It is a natural human response when we find ourselves faced with uncertainty. If someone tells you that they have not been shaken over the past six or seven weeks, regardless of whether they believe we've underreacted or overreacted, they're lying. As of today, we've got over 1.1 million people diagnosed that we know of. There's over 64,000 people in our country who've died. There are 30 million people who've lost their jobs over the last six weeks. Listen, it's legit to feel afraid. We all know what that's like. Fear is a normal part of the human experience. Everybody experiences fear. But here's what I know. You and I can't live that way forever. You can't go the rest of your life being paralyzed and unable to function. So the question becomes, well, what do you do with that fear, right? In a lot of ways, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's at street level what I think Jesus wants to do is to try to provide that answer to that question what do you do with the fear that you experience in your life? Because if we could effectively learn how to deal with our fear, we could actually have a shot at figuring out how to navigate all the stuff that life is throwing at us right now. And so today I wanna to share with you as a part of our Unrelenting Hope series, what I think is a potential cure for fear. And to get at that, I want you to open up your Bible if you're going old school, or you can open up another window and go to Isaiah chapter 41. We're going to be looking at just three verses. Isaiah 41 verses 8, 9, and 10. <clears throat> now, if you're new to the Bible, the prophet Isaiah is kind of in the middle of your Bible for those of you that are actually opening up a real Bible. It's the second largest or the second longest book in the Bible, right behind the book of Psalms. There's 150 Psalms in that bad boy. And if you turn to your right, you're going to come across the prophet Isaiah, 66 chapters long. And we're going to be right there about halfway through in chapter 41, picking up in verse 8. It says this, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farther, farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. See, this word came to the people of Israel at a very precarious moment in their history. They were being pressured by different governments who were beginning to push into their territory. And there was this long succession of kings. Some of them were good, some of them were not so good. And they were watching their entire culture crumble. And they had no recourse, they had no real option to escape. They were filled with fear and they were starting to believe that God, for whatever reason, had forgotten them. <clears throat> but then God raised up a prophet named Isaiah because God wanted to talk to his people. And I believe that their situation and our situation, they're really not that much different. And I believe that God is longing to speak to his people. And by the way, don't make the leap. I'm not comparing myself to the prophet Isaiah. But what I am is one beggar trying to show another beggar where to find bread. 
because I think that the fear that a lot of us are facing right now, while it is legit and it may be real, it does not have to control our lives. So in the first couple of verses, we get some really, really important ideas here. <clears throat> the first one is this, that in times of uncertainty, we find that we have been chosen to serve. That's huge. Over and over again, the Lord, through the prophet Isaiah, is trying to tell them that there is a specific reason for their existence. Listen to what he says in verse 8. But you, Israel, addressing all of the people, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farther, farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. I love this. Because God has chosen not only the children of Israel, but chosen those of us who are following Jesus. See, when we begin to follow Jesus and when we begin to simply respond to him, we begin to realize that our identity in Christ, how we begin to think about ourselves and our lives and our circumstances, that ought to begin to shift. And if we're growing in our relationship with Christ, the shift moves from it's not about me to it's really about we. We should begin to realize, I'm not here to be served. I'm actually here to serve. I honestly think one of the greatest gifts that's been given to those of us who are following Jesus is this desire to do something that's bigger than you are. And I know that we all feel that. That's why we have hope. That's why we go to school. That's why we get married. That's why we engage in the job that we engage because we hope that we're able to experience something that's somehow bigger than we are. That's the way this thing is supposed to work. Jesus expects us over the course of our lifetime to become more and more like him. That's why my goal for you and for your family and for this church called Cokesbury and for my own life is exactly the same every single year. It's that you walk closer to Jesus than you ever have before. That's it. Every single year as we start out, that's the goal for that 12 month period that you learn to walk closer to Jesus than you've ever walked before. No flash, no pretense, no hype, that's it. Because if you and I can focus on becoming more like Jesus, then our church and our community and our world will absolutely change. <clears throat> and the key to this is service. Listen to what Jesus says, Mark chapter 10. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. But not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be, set, uh, to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this story, there is a backstory there. James and John were seeking places of authority and power and influence in this new kingdom that Jesus had come to establish. And just as an aside, it's interesting that even though they're seeking those positions of power, they didn't have the courage to approach Jesus themselves. They actually sent their mom to make the argument on their behalf. I mean, you're talking about the ultimate helicopter parenting moment right there. But they wanted these great places of honor, right? And when everybody else hears what James and John are doing, they start to get frustrated. And they're like, well, why would you do that? And so Jesus calls them all together and reminds them that the world in which they live, and I would argue the world in which you and I live, people want authority. And when they get authority, they want to lord it over everybody else. And so Jesus goes straight at that. He says in verse 43, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. See, 
Jesus is showing us the way. He's trying to remind us that life is not about you and life is not about me. It's not about what we can get. It's not about what we can store up. It's not about what we can manage to hold on to our entire life. <clears throat> it's actually about what we give and about what comes from God that we allow to pass through our fingers. How countercultural is that? <laughs> like that's not anyone's natural default inclination in the world in which you and I live. I'm telling y'all, in times of great fear, our job is always exactly the same. It's to serve. And this is an unbelievably easy time to do it in our cultural history. Because you guys know as well as I do, people are freaking out everywhere. People are panicking, people are hoarding, people feel isolated, they feel lonely. People all over our city and all over whatever city you're sitting in right now as you watch this, they are hurting and our job is to reach out and ask, how can I serve? How can I give? How can I use what I've been given to benefit somebody else? I say it all the time. You can make a point with your life or you can spend your life trying to make a difference. It is virtually impossible to do both. See, I would argue the church is at its very best. This church is at its very best when it's plugged into the heartbeat of the Holy Spirit. The real influence and the real impact and the real sense of change happens the moment the church leaves the building. I know it hurts to not be together right now. But what if in the middle of this national and global tragedy that we're all forced to experience together, what if God actually uses this moment to say to churches like Cokesbury Church, you were never designed to gather giant crowds and feel good about what happens on the weekends. That's the moment you encourage each other. That's the moment you experience community. But the real change that I wanna do in the world, you gotta get out of your seat and you gotta go out there and you've got to engage. What if God uses this season that we're in to actually bring influence in our community? What if lives could be changed? What if hope could well up? What if more people felt loved and connected because churches are actually empty right now? It's a powerful thing to think about. See, when you and I are faced with fear, when we feel like we're losing control, when we feel anxious or desperate for answers, that's the moment to focus on somebody else. It is an antidote for fear, because it is very hard for you and I to be dominated by our circumstances when our focus is placed on meeting the needs of somebody else. So find a way to serve. Now, from there we discover another key in verse 10. God says to Isaiah, to the people of Israel, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. See, what Isaiah is saying is that God's presence really is a cure for fear. God's presence is a cure for fear. When you and I are faced with fear, we need to remember that we're in the presence of God and we don't have to be wrecked by fear. God is saying through Isaiah, whatever those things are that are making you nervous right now, remember, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Remember, I am the all-powerful one. I am the all-knowing one, and I am with you. So you don't have to be dismayed. I am your God. I hold all of time and history in the palm of, of my hand. And the cure for your fear is me. So in times of fear, we've got to cling to and know that we serve a miraculous God. And when we remember that, it not only changes our countenance, but our whole heart is able to rejoice because we start to realize that what may seem huge to us, it's very small to God. See, God is strong and God is sovereign. And every time you feel fear, we all feel it. 
We need to introduce our fear to our God. We need to actually take that fear to God and say, God, you know I'm fearful, but I know you're with me. You know that I believe, but I need you to help my unbelief. You know that I may be weak in this moment, but I know that in my weakness, your strength is made perfect. See, I'm not sure that our problem is actually our current situation. Our problem is that we too easily forget that God is with us in the midst of that problem. See, God's presence, it is the cure for fear. Listen to how John puts it in 1 John chapter 4. <clears throat> he writes, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. See, God's perfect love, that's what you and I experience through the finished work of Jesus. And it helps cast out the fear in our lives. So when we catch ourselves caught up in moments of fear, it's the perfect opportunity for us to exercise faith. I mean, God loves us. And all he's asking in return is that we trust him enough to actually take the next step. You can't worry about what's gonna happen a year from now. You can't worry about what's gonna happen six months from now. It doesn't mean you can't hope and you can't dream, but all we're being asked to do is focus, what is the next right thing for me to do? What is my next step? That's why we talk about it all the time around this place. See, it's that ability to move from, Lord, I wanna stop being fearful to Lord, when I am fearful, help me to remember that you are with me. I was thinking about that this week. Beth and I have got these three sons and um, no one is ever going to come to me and say, hey, Stephen, you did such a great job. You should write a book on parenting. Like that deal is never gonna come because I did a lot of things with my sons that I probably shouldn't have. And one of them was letting them watch scary movies way before they should have watched scary movies. And what I remembered this week is that every time we got in a situation, one of those movies where one of our kids, especially um, if when they were younger, if they freaked out, they just had this natural deal where they would kind of jump over next to me. And I knew that that's the moment that things were getting a little bit scary for them. And so I never really said anything about them. I sure didn't turn the movie off. What I did is I would just kind of put my arm around them and I'd pull them in a little bit closer and I would just kind of whisper so their brothers wouldn't hear. And I'd say, it's okay, daddy is right here. And even though they were scared, because of the presence of their dad, they knew they were safe. I think that's the same thing that is true for you and for me. God's presence really is an anchor for the soul. And I want every one of us to experience that in our present circumstances. God is with you. God is not against you. God is not keeping some checklist, making sure that you get more right than you get wrong. God is not waiting somewhere on the other side of the universe with his finger hovering over a button, waiting for you to mess up. God knows that none of us are perfect. That's why he sent Jesus into the world. So give yourself a break. There are gonna be moments when you're scared. There are gonna be moments when you're anxious. There are gonna be moments when you're tempted to look at other people who maybe aren't experiencing the same level of anxiety as you are, start to come out of their house and they're gonna do things that you don't agree with. Just pump the brakes. We're gonna figure this out together. God is good and God is with you. And so if you're afraid right now, I would challenge you. You're sitting in your house. Just say out loud, God, I'm afraid. Would you remind me in this moment that I'm your son or your, or your daughter and you're right here with me? It's powerful stuff. <clears throat> now, last key to help us deal with our fear. Isaiah 41.10 says, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Friends, in times of fear, 
you and I need to trust God's promises. Because in this passage right here, there are some extraordinary promises being made. Notice there are three I will statements. Through Isaiah, God says to the people of Israel, I will strengthen you. He says, I will help you. And he says, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In our current situation, I'm telling you, you can trust those promises. And listen, I know you and I live in a culture where people make all kinds of promises and very seldom do they actually carry through on that promise. You and I can actually believe a promise, but then ultimately not trust the promise. It's kind of like this stool, right? I can say that I believe that this stool can hold yours truly's weight, and trust me, it's quite a bit of weight. I can say that I, I trust that, I believe that this stool can hold my weight, but that's not really trusting. See, I don't actually trust that stool until I'm willing to sit on that stool and lift my feet up off the ground. The mental ascent doesn't happen until I'm willing to put my full weight on that stool and lift my feet up, knowing that that stool is gonna carry my weight. That's the way it is with God's promises. It's one thing for me to stand in front of a camera in an empty room and say, you need to cling to God's promises. And I know for a fact that those of us that are following Jesus, when life's going exactly the way we want it to go, it's way easier to say that we believe in God's promises. But then you let something not go our way. You let one bad decision, you let one mistake, you let one shortcoming, you let one failure enter into our life, and then suddenly the enemy uses that moment to kind of shake us to the core of who we are. And it is so easy to convince ourselves, even though we'd never say it out loud, that yeah, I believe in God's promises, but the truth of that promise is for somebody else because you don't know what I've done. And you don't know what I'm dealing with. And you don't know the thoughts that go through my head. And you don't know the level of anxiety that I feel. Or you don't know the level of disconnectedness and, and isolation. Stephen, you don't know the level of grief that I'm going through because my life has so radically changed over the last six weeks. Yeah, I understand that. So is mine. But what I know is that God's got a plan, that God's got a purpose, that even now as you and I are spending this moment together, that God is working all of this stuff for good. I believe in hope. And I believe that if you and I will trust in God's promises, we can actually begin to use those promises to give us a deeper sense of courage. We can lean into those promises to find a level of strength that maybe we've been unable to tap into over the past few weeks. We can use it to instill a sense of peace in the midst of all of the chaos. It's God's promises that we can use to begin to flan, uh, fan the flames of hope deep down in our souls. The question is, can you do that? Just over the next seven days, God's promises are not hard to find. Every single one of us has way more time on our hands than we used to. Can you do it over the next seven days? Maybe you just spend a little time this afternoon trying to find seven promises in Scripture. You can even cheat, right, because nobody knows. You can go Google the promises of God and you'll get seven of them at least. Can you take one a day and can you just, as you start every single day, you could do this if you're a parent with your kids. Use it to kind of kick your morning off right, right, before you um, share breakfast together. Maybe you just want to take one of God's promises. You want to you speak it out loud. Maybe you want to let that be your prayer today. God, I'm gonna to cling to this promise. Can you help me live in that promise today? See, I believe that when we do that, when we look for opportunities to serve, and when we embrace this idea that God really is with us, that he's not disinterested, that he's not distant, that he's not impotent to react to our current situation, and when you and I are willing on a daily basis to lean into God's promises, 
It begins to relieve the pressure of fear. It begins to open up our eyes to brand new possibilities. It gives us hope that tomorrow really can be better than today. And guys, I'm telling you, I believe it with every fiber of my being. As difficult and as isolating and as debilitating and as tragic as this season has been and will continue to be, I believe that tomorrow can be better than today. I believe that your life and my life, it may never go back to normal, but it will continue to move forward. And I believe that God is gonna be with us every step of the way. And so Cokesbury Church, you've heard me say it for years. This is one of those moments where in spite of everything that's going on around us, you and I've got a claim to the truth that God holds everything in the palm of his hand, that through the finished work of Jesus, tomorrow is filled with hope. And for that reason, you and I gotta keep our chins up and we gotta stick our chests out. And we've gotta live every moment of every day as the gift that it is. And we've gotta look for opportunities to serve. We've gotta to cling to God's presence in our life. And we gotta find a way to trust God's promises. I hope you guys have a great week. I hope you'll continue to pray for our church. I hope that you'll find a way to make an impact over the next seven days until we have a chance to see each other again. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.